so we're going to shift gears here, talk about something that's maybe not as uh, exciting, but look into problems and stresses to giant clams uh, because we are a conservation group. And so um, we're interested in giant clams because they are threatened. Um, when we look at the IUCN red list of endangered species, they are in the, the family um, Tridacna is listed as vulnerable. And it, you see this picture this is not my picture, but there are just, you can't tell if it's kind of blurry. These are mountains and mountains of giant clam shells. So the rating is different depending on, upon the species. So we call the family vulnerable. Um, but many of the species, especially a lot of these smaller ones that, that, that are kind of, you know, endemic to certain areas are not rated at all. They're either not been evaluated or like Maxima, they, they really don't really have too much problem on a global scale. The only one that's lowest concern, like we don't have to worry about it going extinct right now, is Crocea. Um, so that's the boring clams, right? They're doing pretty well. And, and the main reason why they're doing so well is nobody really eats them. And then we have these ones that are vulnerable, Durasa gigas, which is remember the largest one. Uh, I'm not gonna try Palavulana and Rose watery. So those ones are also vulnerable, but this is on a global scale. The thing about the clams is that their use means that in some areas um, they are eaten or they're utilized for, for trade and, you know, souvenirs and artwork and things like that. And in other areas, they aren't. And this is just a cultural thing. So their actual protection status differs greatly between countries. It's not like whale sharks or something like that, where we can say globally how they're doing. Um, for example, if we were to look in Thailand, where, where we, a lot of our programs are centered, they are, are do not doing very well. Crocea, the boring clam, is vulnerable. Endangered, both Maxima and Squamosa are endangered within Thailand. And Gigas is extinct, not extinct globally, but extirpated, which means that it, it no longer exists in the country of Thailand. It used to. I used to find it there, but not anymore. Um, so if we were to look at other countries, we would find similar differences in the, in the, the protection status of these clams so in many areas, many species, unfortunately, have been extirpated in areas where they are fished. Um, so this would include a lot of areas around like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Philippines, places like that where they are consumed. So the leading threats to the clams, let's go through this a little bit. Um, we have habitat, it's much like most of the other marine organisms, um, habitat destruction of course, overfishing and collection or overutilization of the resource and the aquarium trade, basically, you know, stealing, uh, stealing these organisms um, from one area and selling them somewhere else. And then of course, like anything we talk about, they're also affected by climate change. Now we talk about habitat destruction. I mean, we are talking about when people go in and let's say they like in Singapore and many areas where they're dredging and um, they're pulling up sand or they're actually destroying, you know, actively destroying the coral reef um, with, with dredging and tractors and all that kind of stuff. But what we don't, you know, a little bit more harder to kind of visualize is the destruction of the habitat underwater that be, goes on because of the activities on land. Um, so with land, you know, people want to destroy the forest to build something. Um, so we have deforestation, which leads to erosion, which leads to sediment inundation of the ocean, which leads to stress and burial of our clams. Um, so this is one of the leading reasons why they're going away. Their habitat is, is going away. They don't just being destroyed, physically destroyed. Then there's also overfishing. Um, and overfishing of clams is a huge problem because they're sessile, they don't move around once they're adults. They're non-cryptic, they're very easy to see against the reef, and they don't have any ability to run and hide or to avoid predation. Um, their only, their way of avoiding natural predators is to close up. Um, that doesn't really deter humans. Um, so there's two ways that we generally see humans um, poaching giant clams. So this is the first way, this is a um, captain or a boat boy from a snorkeling boat, tour boat, 
And while everybody else is wearing their life jackets, going around and snorkeling in this bay, he's gone down and he's picking up clams and throwing them into a cooler. Now, sometimes they know that we're watching. And so they become a little bit more crafty. So what they'll do is they will wear their life jacket like all their customers. They'll float on the surface, but they'll take a, a basically a weight on a string. And what they'll do is they'll just stay at the surface. They'll drop that weight into the clam. The clam will close up and then they'll rip the clam up off the bottom, bring it up. They'll use a knife to just get the clam meat right out. And then they'll drop the shell, the evidence back into the water. And then they'll just go back to the boat with all this um, clam meat, cook it up and eat it right there or bring it back to, to the other islands that they live on um, to sell it to some of the um, restaurants and things like that. So it's quite insidious. It's very hard to see them. It's not like a trawler where they're coming in with this boat with huge arms and a net. Um, it's, it's very hard. I mean, getting this picture was just by chance. Um, generally, we can go into a reef and see tons of beautiful giant clams. And then a group like this would come in and they can literally remove every giant clam um, from that reef in a single dive, in a single day. Um, so this is a huge problem. It's not like fish where you take a certain percentage and then they come back in and then a few hours later or something like that. So we have this big problem with overfishing and collection. Um, also tourists. This is on the island of Koh Tao where when I was running the Save Koh Tao community group, these two are Russian tourists who were spotted by a local sitting on the side of the, the beach with a bunch of clams, smashing them up and eating them. So uh, this is, picture was taken in the, in the police station, and this is the mayor of the island having a bit of a talk with them about you know, why we don't do that on our island. So that's like on the local scale, you know, small scale, but this is going on on huge scales. If we look internationally, if we look at you know, the, the Chinese and, and other um, fleets that are going out into the, the Coral Triangle and fishing illegally for, for these clams, um, they're just taking everything basically. And so that's why we're seeing the, the extirpation or the extinction of a lot of these species. And they take them for food, they take them for decoration, souvenirs, you know, if you go to a lot of resorts within the Indo-Pacific, you might see your soap dish or something else is, is a giant clam shell. And so, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very cheap souvenirs that they're making out of this. So quite destructive towards the population. We also have the aquarium trade. Um, giant clams are something which are very nice for an aquarium, a very nice feature to have. And so we do see that a lot of giant clams are stolen from the Coral Triangle area and then shipped around the world for people's aquariums, you know, at home, hobby enthusiasts, or in businesses when they want to show off and stuff like that. Um, we'll see a lot of very large and beautiful giant clams within these, these aquariums. And so the aquarium trade, like a lot of our reef fishes, is a major reason why we are losing our, our wild populations of clams. And lastly, of course, climate change. Um, clams, like corals, like humans, like every other organism, they exist in a very narrow temperature range. So we know with humans, like if our body internal temperature goes up by two degrees Celsius or down by two degrees Celsius, then we're not doing very well and, and we're, we're probably on our way to kick in the bucket. And the same kind of thing goes for the clams, but they are not a warm blooded creature. And so whatever's going on in the water is also going on inside their bodies. They cannot regulate temperature. So if temperature on the reef goes up by one or two degrees, suddenly this mutualistic symbiosis that they have with the dinoflagellates, the zooxanthellae, breaks down. And so it's no longer advantageous for them to have that algae in there. And it's no longer a good place for the algae to be. And so it becomes competition, they're expelled. And what we see in this photograph is the clam without the algae, the white clams, or this kind of translucent color of the clams. But remember, if you've been to our other workshops, like if you were at our mineral accretion workshop, we talked a lot about climate change, how it's not just about temperature, it's also the fact of ocean acidification. So as we're pumping a lot more CO2 into the atmosphere, a lot of that CO2 is being absorbed, most of it's being absorbed by the oceans. 
And when it goes into the oceans, it changes the pH of the oceans. It lowers it by forming carbonic acid. So if a clam, a little baby clam, is trying to utilize its metabolic energy to put down skeleton in the form of a shell, especially that first little bit of a shell to protect itself, and it's living in acidic water that's actively depleting um, the shell, the alkaline calcium carbonate shell that is trying to secrete, then more often than not, it's not going to have the metabolic energy to overcome that. And rather than metamorphosizing into the adult, into the juvenile stage of a clam, it perishes. Um, and so that's what we're seeing more and more. If we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in water, less clams are able to survive. And you can see this in other clam species if you were to look along like the western coast of the US or England, you'll see entire clam fisheries, you know, multi, you know, centuries old fisheries that have just collapsed due to ocean acidification. And giant clams are no different than that. So climate change is the other big thing. Now, but I don't want to depress you guys. I'm not giving you all this information and then you're gonna just walk away. Um, we want to talk about what we can actually do. So how can we intervene? How can we help out these clams? 